Right, give it up for Jesus. Come on, give it up. Make some noise for Jesus today. Jesus is in this house and so grateful for Pastor Melitza, our kids pastor that did an amazing job. And if you were a mega volunteer, would you just stand right now? If you were one of our 40 plus volunteers, just stand to your feet right now. Come on, we wanna recognize you. All right, wonderful job. Yes, that is one of our wonderful, amazing outreaches that we do every single year. And uh, if you are sticking around for the second serve, it's going to be a treat. We've got a cheer that the cheerleaders are going to do. We also have a wonderful mega song that will be put together. And uh, so stick around for that if you can. If not, you can watch it online. Want to welcome everybody online, welcome you in the house today. My name is Pastor Nick. For those that are new this morning, we're so glad to have you as Pastor Lewis welcomed you. I want to welcome you as well. And we're going to go to God's word this morning as we always do in our church. And um, as we do, I know that many of you have jobs that you work outside of church throughout the week. And if you are currently employed right now, my guess is that you have some kind of a job description. Something that defines and clarifies the expectations, puts what we call in the business world metrics or measurables around the skills and responsibilities that your job requires. Now, if you don't have a job description, my guess is you're probably a little frustrated or you're one of those people that's kind of does everything. You don't know what you're supposed to be doing. Uh, And that can be frustrating. I've had jobs like that where I didn't know exactly what I was supposed to do. I want to just tell you a little bit about what I'm doing and working on besides our church stuff as your pastor. Right now, I'm a, a part of a group of pastors. We're called the New York Ministry Network, the Assemblies of God. And we're in the process of creating a job description for the position of the lead pastor of our network or our network superintendent. Now, among other things, that job description will include a portfolio of pastoring or leading over 700 credentialed pastors. That's really a big deal. Plus 300 churches. Think about it. One network superintendent who really has oversight, who is kind of the main leader for over 700 credential holders, 300 plus churches across New York State. And as you can imagine, it's a big task to not only create a job description for that, but to also be the person that might be elected and consider that position that we'll be electing uh, in our May Network Conference in 2025. That's something you can pray for for me as I'm, I'm tasked with being on part of that team that's helping with that. Now, the text that we're going to consider today from Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 to 23 It's not a job description, but it does begin to scratch the surface of the sheer magnitude, the attributes, the contributions, the job, so to speak, of the greatest man that has ever existed. I'm talking about the God-man, Jesus Christ. Jesus is a big deal. (laughs) He's a big deal. Now, I realize that calling Jesus is a, a big deal is an obvious understatement and may even be offensive to those that hold him in the highest regard as the divine son of the living God. And so I believe that that saying he's a big deal is an understatement, and my intent in saying that is not to offend anyone. It's just the opposite. My heart Today, for those that are watching online, for those that are in person today, is to worship Jesus from this pulpit. It's to worship him as the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, as I attempt to preach God's word through this text. My heart today is really full of anticipation. As we consider this text that is before us from Colossians chapter 1, which I would just say is one of the most profound and robust 
and voluminous, whatever, whatever adjective you want to put to it, one of the most beautiful teachings about Jesus that you will ever explore in all of the Bible and in, in, in all of the New Testament. My heart is also hopeful today. Hopeful for those that hear God's word who know Jesus. Because it's easy when you hear a text like this, and many have read it many times, to kind of just, just kind of, yeah, I know this stuff. That would be the, the worst thing it, 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 for, for me today, if you would just kind of just gloss over, I know this today. My heart is to stir your heart again about the greatness of Jesus. Secondarily, my hope is for those that are not yet convinced about whether they should even follow Jesus because of perhaps church hurt or perhaps the, the viewpoint that you come from, the worldview that you come from. My hope today is for those that have not yet been moved by Jesus to be moved today to follow the indescribable Jesus. So here's the map that I want to point out this morning and kind of take us on this, this beautiful Sunday morning. Today we're going to read through this text one time, and, and as we do, I'd like you to read it with me aloud, okay? So get your, your reading glasses on. We'll read it through one time in its entirety. Then I want to go back and unpack four ideas that emerge from this glorious text that reveal this theme, the big deal about Jesus. And then we're gonna close with the song of worship as Susan comes back with the team to lead us before we apply what I believe God wants us to apply. So can we read this text together as worship? Paul says to Timothy, devote yourself to the public reading of scripture. So when we read the Bible, it's worship, just as much as singing a song or giving worship unto the Lord through tithes or offerings. So can we read it aloud this morning? It will be behind me on the screen. The tech team's gonna have it for us. Colossians chapter one, verse 15, together this morning. Let's read it. It says, the son is the image of, of the invisible God. If we can read it out loud, okay? The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Verse 21, once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation if you continue in your faith, established and firm, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel this is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. God bless the reading of his word today. Jesus is a big deal. He's a big deal. Why do I say this? Well, because, first of all, Colossians 1 shows us he's a big deal because Jesus is, is the image of God. 
Jesus is the image of God. Verse 15, we'll read it again. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Now, we've all heard this phrase before, have we not? That that child is a spitting image of their mother and father. Now, I'm not ignorant of the fact today that when anyone looks at my three children, particularly this one that's on the front row here, that they bear a very close resemblance to their mother. Like, really look like my wife. Somebody say praise the Lord for that. Hallelujah, I do. Now, most, most would say that uh, they are carbon copies of my wife, and they are very much in her image, but I assure you that I am their father. I am their father. Paul tells us here that Jesus is the visible image or the form of God, the God who no man has seen or can see because God dwells in inapproachable light, says Paul to Timothy. However, Paul now says that Jesus fully reveals God the Father. That Jesus has put a face and a body to our great God. Do you know that, that Paul uses the word uh, for image here, and it, and it doesn't mean similar like my wife and my daughter or my kids. It literally means that Jesus is the very stamp of the Father. The Greek word that is used there is the word icon. You've heard that word before, right? It, it's the same word from our English language, a copy. Further, the Gospels, which are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they add more color to what Paul says by putting on full display the, the personality, the, the works of God, the intellect of God, the will of God, the power of God, the love of God, the invisible God being revealed in the Son, Jesus Christ. John the Apostle plainly says that the Word, talking about Jesus, was God and became flesh and dwelt among us. Now, Here's why this even matters. This visible image stuff is so important. Friends, God, in all of his mysterious glory, in all of his majesty, in all of his providence and wisdom is now fully seen and wonderfully revealed to mere human beings in the person of Jesus Christ. TNCC this morning, God is no longer invisible or unknowable, uh, as that word means. Invisible means or, uh, uh, unknowable. Uh, instead, he is fully manifest. He is available. He is accessible. He is approachable to us in the person of Jesus Christ. And that's good news today. How profound is this thought? That the God who is eternal and unpackageable, and unboxable became a mere man that hungered and thirsted like one of us, that struggled with temptation like we do, that dealt with pain and dealt with loss, that struggled to overcome temptation that had to wait in lines like we do <laughs> and deal with annoying people like we do. But I want to remind you that Jesus is no ordinary man. He himself did not leave that option on the table. Jesus is the visible image of the invisible God. Friends, when you see Jesus, as he told Philip, one of his apostles, you see the Father the very manifestation of Almighty God. Now, before we leave this idea, something that's important to mention is that Paul calls Jesus the firstborn over all creation. The firstborn. So, does this mean that Jesus is created, the firstborn of God's works, the first of God's creations, like one of the angels who are created, or specifically, 
that Jesus is the first of God's creation. Well, actually, it does not mean that. In the Bible, this term firstborn does not necessarily mean first in birth order, as in an eldest son or daughter. My daughter here is my firstborn. That's not what Paul is saying here, but instead what he's saying is that this word can be used and translated as a title for priority, for position for preeminence, that Jesus is the first in rank. He is the first in position. In fact, there are other examples in scripture where God calls David in the Psalms his firstborn, being the lastborn. What he's saying is that David is first in rank and that he goes on to talk about throughout the scriptures, the Lord does, that from that line of the firstborn will come the true firstborn in rank, the Messiah. So when Paul says that Jesus is the firstborn over all creation, what he means is that Jesus is before all created things. He's before these things, that he has priority and position and preeminence over and above even creation. Which leads us to the second idea from the text, which is this, that Jesus is not only the image of God, he is the Lord over creation. He's the Lord over creation. Look at this in verse 16. It says, for in him all things were created, things in heaven and on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. This is what Paul is saying here. He's saying that everything that exists has been created by Jesus. The visible image of God, the firstborn over creation from the human chromosomes. Just one of them, do you understand, has enough bits of information to fill 4,000 volumes on a library shelf. He has created all things like Saturn's rings, which have a circumference of 500,000 miles. Get this in your head. But are only are only one foot thick at their max. That he is the creator of of this earth which orbits the sun right now at eight times the speed of a bullet fired from a gun. Do you understand that that Jesus is our creator? He's Lord over creation. In other words, as beautiful as nature and culture and the diversity of the nations are, they are but a small part of our creator, Jesus' creation. And we can give God praise for that. He is Lord over creation. Paul specifically mentions that he's Lord and creator of thrones and powers and rulers and authorities, visible and invisible. They've been made by Jesus for Jesus. Friends, here's what this means. It means that the physical rulers the presidents and the kings and the senators and the governors and and the mayors, the rulers and leaders of this world visible serve God's ultimate purposes. The invisible rulers, even those that are opposed to God, like demons and Satan himself, they are all a part of God's plan to bring all things under his dominion in the new heavens and the new earth. It also means that these unseen rulers and authorities and powers, whether they they be evil or, or good, have been created by Jesus for his purposes. So to quote St. Bob Marley, don't worry about a thing because every little thing is gonna be all right because the one who holds this whole world in his hands isn't worried. He's Lord over creation. He's king over creation. He's really not a saint, I was just saying, okay? (laughs) My friends, no created thing, not even Satan himself, can stand against the Lord of creation. No evil. 
Listen to me, no failure, no mistakes this week, no shame, no loss, no pain, no political power, and not even fear can separate us as believers from Jesus, our creator, who's Lord over the world he's made. One more thing. For those that love creation, talking to young people, so many young people that love the environment and love to talk about creation and, and, and sustaining the planet that God has given us, the environment. Listen, if Jesus is the sustainer and creator of everything, then it also means he cares about this little science project called Earth that he created. He cares about the people plus the environment where his creation dwells. And he expects us to care too. Go back and read Genesis where he gave dominion over creation to us, human beings, and expects us to take care of it. So let's, let's zoom out for a second here. Let's take a moment and take a breath. Jesus is a big deal. He's a big deal. He's not just some great moral teacher who lived a good life, who dropped wisdom on the world, who fed the poor and was nice to people on the margins. Jesus is the very image of God. Jesus is the Lord over and sustainer of creation. Also, friends, Jesus is the head over the church. This is the third idea that I want to bring out for us today. Jesus is the head over his church. Verse 18, and he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy for God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on the earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Friends, if the creation and the environment is God's science project that we get to project manage, then the church is God's relational focus group <laughs> that we get to labor with him in building. What a privilege that our God gives us the ability to get our hands dirty in this thing called the church. See, at our church, you've heard us say it before this morning, we like to say that Jesus is the hero of our faith, of our words and our actions. And in calling him hero, it's another way of saying that he is the leader, that he is the head over his church because Jesus has supremacy in all things and especially in his local church, which is his bride, which is his body, which he purchased for himself. So why, why do we call Jesus and not a pastor or a priest or a pope for that matter, the head of the church, his church? First of all, Jesus is the head or leader of his church for some very specific reasons. And I wanna give this, so this is point three. I'm gonna give you three quick reasons why Jesus is the head. Why do we call him the head? Why do we say this isn't Pastor Nick's church, it's Jesus' church? I'll tell you why. Number one, Jesus is head because he rose from the dead. He's head because he rose from the dead. Paul calls Jesus the firstborn or the first fruits from among the dead. No, I realize that this isn't Easter Sunday, but I want to remind us again about the resurrection, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is the single greatest reason to believe that Jesus said he was who he said he was. For those that are struggling with doubt, where is God? Remember the resurrection. Come back to the resurrection. That miracle beyond miracles that Jesus said he was going to do and he did it. And friends, listen to me. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, we have no business being here today. Our faith is futile. We're fools. But if Jesus did rise from the dead, if Jesus did come out of that tomb after suffering and after dying for our sins, then, friends, it is proof. It is proof that he is the exclusive way, the exclusive truth, and the exclusive life to the Father God. And that everything he said is true. If he could do that, he can do anything and did do everything well. Second, Jesus is head because he is God. He's head because he rose from the dead. He's head because he is God. Verse 19 talks about this. 
Now, I know that we mentioned this earlier in the, the visible image part, but it's worth fully clarifying because verse 19 tells us this, that all of God's fullness, that word for fullness is completeness. It means leaving nothing out, is found in the exact image of God, Jesus Christ. This is what separates Christianity from the world religions and from the cults. You'll always boil it down to Jesus. Who do you say I am? That's what Jesus said. And the answer to that is the most important answer in all of history. And I say, along with Paul, that he is not only the visible image of God, but that he is God in his fullest. Friends, we believe in this church that Jesus is fully God, the second member of God's holy trinity. The Father is good, and Jesus is also good. The Father is the Savior. Apart from me, Isaiah says, there is no Savior. And Jesus steps on the scene and says that the Son of Man came to seek and save those that were lost. The Father is creator, and so is the Son who created fish and loaves out of nothing. The Father is the healer and the raiser of the dead, and so is Jesus who raised people to life, including Lazarus, the daughter of Jairus, and the widow's son, at name. In short, my friends, there is nothing that the Father has that Jesus does not also possess. One of my favorite examples of this is in Mark chapter 2, and I'll just summarize it. I love this text. It's one of my favorite texts in the New Testament in Mark 2, where a paralytic is brought to Jesus by his four friends. You know that story, right? And they lower him down in the roof. You know, there's a whole theology lesson on the deity of Christ in that beautiful text. Or the de when we say the deity of Christ, a doctrine that means that we believe Jesus is God in the flesh. In the story, a man was lowered down before Jesus. And Jesus forgave his sins. He said, I forgive your sins. And then backed it up by healing his body which caused the Pharisees, the religious leaders in the room, to ask the question, who can forgive sins but God alone? You see, the Pharisees had the God alone part, forgiving sins, right. They understood rightly that God alone forgives sins. The part they missed was that all the fullness of God dwelt in Jesus. That word for dwelt is permanent. It's not a dwelling temporarily. It's a permanent dwelling in the Greek. Friends, in Paul's day, as he wrote this letter from a Roman prison, he was imprisoned in Rome for two years. This is likely where he wrote this letter in the first century. He wrote it because there were many false teachers back then, as they are today, that were teaching that Jesus was not fully God. Or that you needed something other than Jesus, like secret knowledge or following the law, being circumcised, observing the feast, all those things, to be saved. But friends, when anyone attempts to diminish Jesus or his gospel, which is that we are saved, what? By faith. We're saved uh, by grace through faith, right? When anyone attempts to diminish that, it is no small thing. And it is likened to cutting off the head from the body. And if you cut off a head, Jesus is the head. If you cut off a head from a body, <laughs> in the natural, you're going to have problems. Jesus is a big deal. Jesus is a big deal. He is the way to God. Paul says in Colossians 1 that he's the visible image of God, that all of God's fullness dwells permanently in Jesus. And in Colossians 2 and 9, Paul completes the thought by stating that Jesus is the fullness of God who lives in a body, in bodily form. Before adding, listen to this, the whipped cream with the cherry on top in verse 10. He's the fullness of God who dwells in bodily form. And then he says in verse 10, and you have been given fullness in Christ. Hallelujah. You have been given the fullness of Christ, who is head over every power and authority. We have the authority and power of the head in our lives as his church. Hallelujah. How awesome. How graceful is Jesus. Sounds a lot like our friend John, who echoes this thought when he says in his opening thoughts, the prologue in John 1, that no one has ever seen God, but God, the one and only, who is at the Father's side has made him known. No one's ever seen God, but God, who is at the Father's side, has made him known, John 1 and 18. 
And if Jesus is indeed God, then friends, he is Lord over creation. He is Lord over his church. He's the hero of this house. This is his church. We are his sheep. We exist to follow and worship Jesus. Hallelujah. Jesus is the head because he rose from the dead. He's the head because he's God. Thirdly, he's head because he bled. He's the head because he bled. Verse 20, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace, how? Through his blood shed on the cross. You see, the ideas of sacrificial leadership, we hear a lot about it in the corporate world, be a servant leader, empower others, lift up others, serving people that are difficult to serve. It really finds its highest order in Jesus Christ. See, Jesus doesn't simply do all the above, serve people. He dies for his enemies. Do you understand that? This is what separates Jesus from all the rest. He doesn't die simply for his followers. He dies for his enemies. He dies for those that rejected him and wanted nothing to do with him so that they can have peace with the Father. In fact, Paul says that Jesus' purpose in death was to reconcile all things, things on the earth, things in heaven, to himself. Now, what is that about? Reconciling all things. Again, I think it's a future picture. Or an image of the kingdom of God that is coming. We went to the Daniel play with the men. And it was all about this kingdom of God. And we loved it because it had a kingdom focus. That the kingdom of God is coming. That Jesus has come one time. And my friends, he's coming again. Not to die and bear sin. But to rule and to reign over this earth for eternity. It's a picture of reconciliation, that all things will serve him, that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of the Father. Now we'll talk more about this, but for a moment, can we consider here as we talk about the fact that he bled, the sacrifice of Jesus. See, we love to talk about the peace of God, the benefits, the abundant life, but it cost Jesus everything. The head of the world shed blood for the world. Don't move too quickly past that image in your mind of a brutally beaten, unrecognizable, tortured, yet perfect, spotless, blameless Savior hanging on a tree for his enemies. Jesus died a horrible death. And lest we think his enemies are them out there, it's me and you, my friends. We are sinners separated from God until we receive by grace, through faith, the gift of eternal life. Jesus died a horrible death. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Is this uncomfortable to think about? Absolutely. And it explains why even the authors of the Gospels, they don't go into great gory details. They don't do like a Hollywood rendition. That's like Mel Gibson and all the other guys that are doing Jesus. But do you notice how simply and almost ashamedly they tell the story of Jesus that he had nails in his hand? They just move past it because friends, these were his best friends. As they are thinking back to what Jesus did, it was very difficult for them to write about it and to talk about it. They want us to know that he certainly died. But it's not all the glory Hollywood details in the Gospels. If you've ever watched a loved one suffer and die, you know, right? You don't want to talk so much about that as their life and what they were. Same with these gospel authors. They talk about the death, but they talk about it in a way to show us his glory and salvation. My friends, Jesus, the head, became the tail. Jesus, the master, became a slave for his church. The firstborn over all creation became last and least in all creation. His disciples, except for John, were not there by his side. They took off. Jesus watched his own mother watching him die. He was placed in a borrowed tomb. 
Jesus, the head, washed feet, and he also washed us white as snow. Hallelujah. Which leads us home. What's the big deal about Jesus? He's the visible image of God. He is the Lord of creation. He is the head over his church. And finally, Jesus is the reconciler of all things. Hallelujah. Look at this again in verse 21. Once you were alienated from God. That's all of us in this room that were, are now born again. You were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. But now, come on, say it with me. But now, come on, say it with me. But now. He has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation if you continue in your faith, established and firm. And do not move from the gospel, the hope held out in the gospel this is the gospel that you heard and has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. Friends, we've talked so much about the indescribable Jesus and rightly so, but I also love how Paul closes this section by talking about what Christ's death and resurrection accomplishes for the church. Here's what it means for us. In verse 22, it says, we who were once enemies are now reconciled, we're made right with God. I wonder if you've ever been estranged from someone. You know that awkward moment when you run into someone that you haven't seen in a while, like you used to be tight, you used to get checkers together, you used to get waffle fries together, but now, listen, I don't want your waffle fries, I'm going to McDonald's, I'm not going to Chick-fil-A if you're there. You know what I'm talking about? You ever been estranged from someone? Makes it awkward when you go to that family gathering or that that function, or you see them in, on the street, there's a strain, there's a blocking of communication and connection, to say the least. It leaves a relational gap, right? Something that was once there is now lost. But I want you to think about this. There was no greater relational gap than the one between the God of heaven and the creation that he made because of sin. Sin literally keeps us out of fellowship with God. I think we cheapen this idea of God's love. The wrath of God, the wrath of God was upon us. But Jesus took the wrath of God for us. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. See, we did God dirty, but God touched down onto the dirt of this earth. And through his death, God reconciles us to himself. And it gets even better. God doesn't seat us at the back of the room, right? You know, like sometimes you, you make up, you have that cup of coffee, you shake hands, and then you don't really talk again. <laughs> like, oh yeah, we made up, right? Like I have kids, I know, right? When they say I'm sorry and they don't really mean it, right? You know what I'm talking about? Like you can do that, but that's not what God does for us. He doesn't seat us at the back of the room. The Bible says he presents us in front of heaven's eyes, holy in his sight, without blemish, free from accusation as his beloved bride. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus, for your grace. All he asks all he asks, church, for those that follow Jesus, is that you continue. Continue in my works? No. Continue in your faith. It is by faith you're saved. Continue in my good works? Be a good person? Tithe? No. You can do those things, but those things won't save you. What saves you is your faith. Continue in your faith. Be moved to worship him in your faith. Be reminded that he's the head. Be reminded that he's the visible image, that he's a big deal, that he gave his life for you. Continue in your fired up faith for Jesus Christ. Continue in the gospel. The good news that Jesus died in your place. Jesus is a big deal. <laughs> He's a visible image of our God. He's Lord over creation. He's head over this church and every church. He's the reconciler of all things. Can we have the worship team come up?
Hallelujah. Can we give God some praise in this place? What an awesome text of scripture. What an amazing teaching about who Jesus is. May you be armed and equipped, Christian, to stand in awe of God this week. If your faith is drying up, man, I hope that you've been reignited today and inspired to see the beauty, the matchless, endless, glorious beauty of the Savior that we get to call our Deliverer and Messiah, Jesus. Hallelujah. Have access to him. So this morning, I want to ask, is there anyone in this space that needs to know Jesus? Can we just close our eyes for a moment and just bow our heads as we just make this a solemn moment, a real opportunity to just connect with Jesus? I want to first talk to those in the room, like I mentioned at the top of this message, that may not know who Jesus is. I mean, you may know about him, you may know all these facts, but you really realize that today you don't have a relationship with Jesus. It's more like you're kind of a fan, perhaps, or you, you have some connection with him, but you really don't know him. You really don't, you don't really know him as all of these things for you. I'm not talking about for your grandma or your aunt or your uncle, but for you, you don't know him in this way. But today you want to. And listen, I'm talking to maybe someone who's been sitting in the, in, the, in the pews for a while, but they've really not made that decision to follow. I'm not just talking to somebody that's new today, perhaps. I'm talking to those that are in the room, maybe those that have played a good game for a long time, but they know they're not really, really in relationship with Jesus. And they're saying, today I want to know Jesus as Lord and leader of my life. I want to apply that shed blood to my sins. I want to be forgiven, and I want to walk with Jesus. Is there anybody in this room, before we move on to the next idea, I don't want to move too quickly. This is why we do what we do on Sunday, to share the good news of Jesus, who he is. Today, this message is for not only the non-believer, but for the believer. We'll get to that in a moment, but first for the one that maybe wants to follow Jesus. Would you lift your hand? If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and leader, and you'd say, you know what, Pastor, yes, I need to come to a relationship with Jesus for the first time. Lift your hand. This is the safest place that you could ever decide to do this because most of the people in this room have made this decision, but I don't want to assume that all have. That's why we share the gospel week after week after week because we want to, we want to reach out to people with the most important news. Is there anybody here that doesn't know Jesus that would like to? Lift your hand, and we want to pray for you. Anybody here? Okay, for the, for the rest of you that are in this space, I'll assume you're a believer. Now, again, if, you, if you're not, then come see me. We'll talk. You don't have to raise your hand to become a Christian. You have to believe. If you need to meet with someone, talk with someone about that, we'll be available. Maybe you're here today and you're saying, you know what? Jesus is Lord, but he's not really leading my life. Like, I know he died for my sins and I prayed the sinner's prayer, but I, he's not really leading. Not leading my my relationships, my finances. He's not leading in my job or even in my thinking. And today I want him to be, to be Lord over my life. I want him to be king over my life. And you're saying yes to Jesus, yes to him. I want to follow him, I want him to lead my life. Or maybe you need reconciliation in a relationship with another person. Or maybe you and, and God aren't tight right now, like you're a follower of Jesus, but there needs to be some confession and admission of some sin, maybe some pride or idolatry or, or greed or something else, distraction. Maybe you've been prayerless. Maybe you've made plans without really consulting God and now you're in a situation, you're like, wow. Maybe today's a day of reconciliation between you and God where you say today, Jesus, let's get it right. Maybe you need to realign your life that word if, if you continue in your faith. You look at your faith and it's not very robust. Can we just stand to our feet here today? And if any of that describes you, any of that describes you, we're not gonna give a big altar call here. What we're gonna ask you to do is this, Susan sings and leads us in a song here in a moment that we would just lift our hands to heaven in a really profound way and a really serious way and just worship our King 
as the visible image of God, as the reconciler of all things, as the head over his church, as, as the Lord of creation. Come on, if he's Lord of creation, he deserves your best praise. He deserves your heart today. Amen? Come on, not some cheap in fashion, quick, let's get out of here. It's almost time to go to the diner. No, God, you are worthy. In fact, can we lift our hands in this place and begin to thank our creator, begin to thank our reconciler, begin to thank Jesus for becoming the visible image, coming to earth so we could live and be made right with God. Can we lift all of our hands across this place and open our mouths right now in front of our brothers and sisters and testify that I love Jesus. Come on, begin to tell the Lord, I love you, Lord. Oh, I worship you, Jesus. Oh, I believe in you, Jesus. God, light my heart on fire for you again, Jesus. Oh, worship team, come on, let's praise the Lord today. Oh, let's lift our hearts and our hands to Jesus, the King of kings and Lord of lords, the only one who we say is Savior today. Come on, let's sing this morning unto our King. Jesus.